Okay, and we're on. So, uh, hello, James. How are you doing? Tired. It's late. <laughs> Tired. It's late. Well, not my problem. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we're here to talk about this new Indiegogo tabletop RPG project you have going on. I'm going to start by showing the Indiegogo video now. Whitechester, Prison City of the Damned, is currently funding on Indiegogo. Please go there and support this city crawl for 5th edition and probably Morkborg, Grimdark, and Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Okay, so that was a nice video. And uh, you, I, I think from what I read, you have some, some really, um, how can I put this? You're really motivated by this project because it, you're really ambitious by it, which is a good sign. I find like when, you know, when writers are, this is going to sound weird, but when writers are humble about their projects, I'm like, mm, like how much <laughs> you believe in it, really? So I like that you're ambitious um, because you've said some things like this is going to set an example on how to perhaps do a, that, this sort of environment for tabletop yeah. RPGs. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, that kind of thing doesn't come easy to me, but I've had people hammering it into me that you really have to talk yourself up, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and, and talk about what, what, your, what your ambition for a project is um and your enthusiasm for it but it's very un-british to to sell yourself and to say uh, you know i'm amazing or whatever so i tried to find a middle ground and yeah it's i am trying to do something different and it's a it's going to be a big book it probably should be about 500 pages when it's all done and all it's detailing really is this one city but because it's describing locations one after another. It's not like you have to read the whole thing in one go or um, absorb a whole bunch of new and different rules or, or, or anything like that. You know, you should hypothetically, with very little prep, just be able to pick the book up and, and, and go um, because the, the encounters and the various things will be there. And it's meant to be mainly a sort of free roaming city so you can go anywhere and you can discover anything you can interact with anything uh, and the gm shouldn't really need to do a, a huge amount of prep so it, it, it's it's a sandbox that's all laid out there for you um with a lot of tools to help you revisit locations and remember what happened last time and yeah allow the city to develop and change over time now the concept is basically like all the undead are trapped in uh, Whitechester, and um, then you have uh, the characters. Player characters are, from what I understood, I'm sure maybe other people go about it different ways, like maybe a rescue mission or stuff like I don't know. But um, the way that the the default presentation is, the player characters are prisoners in there. They've been sent to jail, basically to die in there, and um, now. This is going to be a bit weird. We're going to be talking about this, but if this is too much of a spoiler for the book, anything I'll ask, anything we're talking about, or even if you're afraid of divulging a good idea before the book is out, just say so. Mm. So just say, you know what? Spoilers. Well, I'm, and, I'm, uh, about, yeah. I'm about two thirds to three quarters through yeah. finishing it. So. so I was kind of going to ask, is this going to be like strong on isolation where like the player characters are really the only ones around, or can we expect sort of a... Um, uh, kind of like uh, pocket societies within that of of living people. Okay, so or is that too spoilery? Or? No, I don't. I don't think that's too spoilery. I mean, if it was just the same shambling zombies everywhere, it would get boring quite rapidly. Um, so you you have to have some other elements in there, things that are different. Um, so it's set in 1667 the year after the the famous year of miracles uh when newton put out his major publications uh the year after the great fire and the plague <laughs> that came back to the uk so you know it's it's had a it's had a rough old go of it we'll um, get to plagues we'll get to plagues in it <laughs> 
and so this city is the yeah the the rising of the dead was put down and this city was the last one that was overrun and they just walled walled it in and yeah in, in british history we had a time of massive amounts of executions for yeah all, all manner of even quite petty crimes um like proof of malevolence in a child you you know you could you could execute the child and it wasn't terribly specific how did what any meant. child survive that era <laughs> <laughs> or um like a gentleman's silk handkerchief was worth a lot of money yeah. and if what you'd stolen was over a certain amount you were sent to the gallows and if we weren't hanging people we were sending them overseas to the colonies so it seemed like a natural expansion of that sort of horrendously unfair judicial system to basically throw people over the wall <laughs> where, where the dead are so the the base idea is that the vast and overwhelming majority of people other than madmen that, that go in there are prisoners who are basically you know given some bread and cheese you know a flask of water and just sort of pushed in you yeah, know make the best of it <laughs> survive if you can um so the idea is that this kind of disposes of the prisoners gets them out of everyone's way doesn't require as much resources and so on as transportation um and that maybe eventually the people in there will get organized enough to wipe out the dead and then the city can be resettled mm -hmm. so the sort of um default opening area will be an area right near the gate that previous prisoners have managed to seal off and fortify so there'll be a few people there there'll be a settlement there and there will be occasional survivors scattered here and there throughout the city that have managed to eke out a living one way or another um i just wrote a section about uh, a half mad artist who's walled himself up in a garret in the top floor of a of a slum rookery um and he just spends all his days painting zombies that, that's that's all he does <laughs> and he hasn't had any human contact at all unless the players happen to come across him and you know, he he doesn't want to go anywhere he just wants to keep doing his work but you know he knows things and he might have supplies so do you kill him and, and take his things for your greater survival do you try and help him recuperate do you go through his paintings what do you do with this zombie he's got up there with as a model to paint <laughs> yeah. so there'll, there'll be incidences like that and it's um it's quite a varied a varied city with quite different districts and and areas of course it's not the size of a modern metropolis but for the time it's pretty big yeah and um if i might if i might go with the hard questions james why would yeah. anyone get out of the initial safe zone <laughs> why would anyone go beyond it <laughs> well there's no farmland you need supplies okay um so and the newbies have to earn their place ah. so they will probably be sent out to, to scavenge and so on okay and it's um like like in most real prisons you know there's some illicit trade that goes on maybe some of the guards are willing to exchange some food or drink or, or something in exchange for the for the gold or the jewelry or the the fine crafts and things that were left behind when most people fled the city so you know you might be able to get a few things at an extortionate rate from some of the guards this is interesting because it's kind of normally there are city crawls and then you have mega dungeons from what you describe it's like you've combined the city crawl and the mega dungeon into a single experience it's kind of interesting because going back to that initial spot the camp or whatever you call it uh, is kind of like going back to the city right you come back with the goods yeah that's the event so it's kind of interesting it seems like you combine the city crawl and the mega dungeon in a way um so so that's uh that's pretty interesting and yeah you're talking about like prison and guards and um i am working on an actual play uh that it <laughs> does involve like a prison and all that so i've kind of went well i mean different context from yours of course but i kind of went to look at stuff that happens and yeah for sure like uh guards are you know like uh a lot of them go there even like with the notion that there's profit to be made um, yeah 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 and so. this in this case you know being near the biggest concentration of, of the undead that still remains it's not going to be a duty most soldiers want 
No. Um, so my my idea is basically that it's some of the uh, some of the more criminal, <laughs> borderline criminal soldiers. Plus, it was a big time for political upheaval um, in England. You had the restoration of the monarchy after Cromwell's time, and so all the old roundheads and the parliamentarians fell out of favour, and you had a lot of radical sort of millennialist religious and, and political cults like the ranters, the diggers, the levellers, and so on. So this is probably a good place for a bunch of dissident soldiers who used to fight for Cromwell to just be, you know, go and watch that city, mm -hmm. stay out of everyone else's way. <laughs> And we'll, uh, because you know, like I'm kind of nodding, but I'm nodding like in trust. Like I trust you that inf historical information you're giving me is, is right because I'm not particularly good at history, which is kind of why I always gravitate towards, like, let's say, uh, like um, fantastical settings that are kind of like this era, but it, because I'm lazy, I don't want to do the homework, you know, like um, <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, you, said. Yes, will Whitechester have some bullet points? Because of course, I think people can go online these days, but will they have some bullet points for people like me who, um, you know, just to get the crawl started without me having to do homework online on the era or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I've, I've, got a, I've got a potted history at the beginning. Um, and what was, another thing that was important to me was to make this city as authentic as possible. So I actually went as far back as the Stone Age and considered you know, what was going on in the area, um, drawing a lot of inspiration from the from the land around me because this fictional city is is set in a similar sort similar sort of location. Um, and then I built the city up by degrees from like a an Iron Age village and hill fort to something bigger than you know the Normans invading and putting up a Mott and Bailey castle and and so on. So I've actually built it up no one will ever see most of that, but yeah. I've actually built it up in an in an organic way. Um, but the, the beauty of it being an enclosed environment is if you don't want to bother learning any of the history, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, I was thinking but that. It's, but it's, like but it's there if you want it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's always good. And, um, you know, it's just to kind of get started, you know, and in the same way, I think it's no worse than the a fantasy setting when, OK, I guess who's the king, you know, and then someone just because a player knows it, they'll bring up like, oh, by the beer of King XYZ, you know, like, or something. And yeah. they already feel more involved in the setting. So I think just like having a few bullet points, even if you're not like that versed in history, just like that you feel that you already know a little bit the era a bit more, you're already kind of more into it, you know, like more like, oh, yeah. yeah, this is, it reminds you. Um, I've legit done, you know, like, this is kind of funny, but I legit did a Call of Cthulhu game one time I, I was a player and it was meant to be in France. And you know, I'm I'm French Canadian, I'm half French Canadian, half Spanish. So when you tell about, the, about modesty and all that, my half Spaniard side is like, well, that's even that word. But <laughs> <laughs> British, what now? Um, but- um, British Reserve. Uh, what? <laughs> so um, yeah, so anyway, so we were playing uh, supposedly in, in a previous age of France, but we kept reverting just to, we, being in Quebec in the Nouvelle France, the new new France, you know, like just for some reason there was some that we're speaking with the Quebecois accent, and there were no reminders in the story that we were in that era, you know. So, mm. um, but again, like it's not like the um, it was a really good game by the way, but the game master hadn't really dropped any real historical information other than oh it's going to be France in that era. So, for some reason we kept reverting back to Quebec. And at the end, we just retcon. You know what? It's in Quebec. Yeah, like it's in the province of Quebec in Canada, <laughs> the Nouvelle France at that time, and that's just what it is because we kept like mentally going back there. And I think like just having a bit of just give players a little bit of the same you would with a fantasy setting or whatever. Like just yeah. look here are some because you're already talking about Cromwell and all that. I might even go a little bit later, and I'm kind of curious. Like you know, like it's, it, I don't well, know all the history, but. <laughs> Yeah. One of my ancestors uh, was Sir Jonathan Disbrow, who was, so Cromwell divided the country up into sections to be ruled, uh, and that was ruled by the major generals who were sort of major military commanders who'd worked under him, and my ancestor was one of those major generals, uh, <laughs> and one cool. of the signatories on the warrant to kill Charles I, so. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. So republicanism is is in my veins. <laughs> but and that that's in is that in the same era, uh, the 1600s. Yes, yeah, that's, that... that's before. That's just before this. So this is about before. Okay. Yeah, this is about twenty to thirty years after the English Civil War. So you're are you putting are you going to put your ancestor in the book? Um, probably not. No. Um, you know, if you think it's too late. Right. Yeah, it's a bit a bit too late. And though there was a younger Captain Disbrow who became a highwayman. So. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a lot of choices. If you fought for Parliament, yeah. then yeah. when the king came back, you know, you didn't really you, you lost a lot of position and wealth and lands. And yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a rough time for people. So the, the random encounter. Because... <laughs> yeah, maybe a highwayman. But yeah, you don't need to know, you know, in depth the sort of English Renaissance and, and 17th century London or anything. Basically, all you need to know is there was a plague. Mm -hmm. England was at war with Holland. Uh, the capital city practically all burnt down. And then where we part ways with, with real history is that there is some low level sort of magic and an old nature worship and, and stuff going on here and maybe there are creatures and things in the shadows here and there but on this one particular event you know the dead actually rose from the grave and that's really our our departure point from from reality are clerics an option in this setting so you can just play it with normal 5e if you want okay. But okay. I don't think that fifth edition is particularly suited to the kind of grim, gritty, dark kind of setting that I have in mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can do that. I wouldn't recommend it particularly. But if you are going to play it with 5e, maybe exclude the magical classes okay. so that you can only play um, fighters and rogues and barbarians, you know, th 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 things like that. Um, but there are background options and things that you can take with characters that could give you some very low level magic if you do it that way, which could work. You know, if you if you're limited to cantrips and, and first level spells, then that might be OK. Um, I have my own rule set, uh, which is a modification of 5e called Grimdark, uh, which actually is deal of the day on drive through tomorrow. So if you want to pick it up cheap. It's a good time to to get that. Yeah. So that's a modified version of 5e, um, which does suit the more grim, gritty style of play. Um, if I get to half funding by Saturday morning, there will be an old school renaissance sort of conversion booklet. And uh, the funding has already unlocked a, a Morkborg conversion booklet. Mm -hmm. So you'll have plenty of options to play and I might add more later on by adding more conversion booklets. That leads me to actually another hard question. Uh, given the setting, um, why 5e? Um, because it's the most popular version of the game, I want as many people as possible to see this mm -hmm. and to be exposed to different ways of playing. So yeah. it's kind of a, a bait and switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, br bring in the 5e players yeah. and show them that there are other ways to play and that uh, misery tourism can, can be fun as well. <laughs> it definitely can. Um, like my players can attest to that in, in my home <laughs> games. Like they, lots of bad things happen to them regularly. They're just used to it by now. Uh, but um, that that sounded worse than it. Like that probably sounded worse than it actually is. As I note, um, <laughs> although <laughs> although one time one one player uh, her character, the character ended up with no arms and blind, and she kept playing that that <laughs> character. <laughs> so for a while until magic could restore <laughs> her limbs and well, the characters his limbs inside. So she was playing yeah. this uh, male barbarian and. So she, yeah. So she went around <laughs> with that character with a helm and spiky boots and kicking blindly. Or I'm just going by the rules. Like, okay, so if you're blind, you can attack. You're just at minus this much, and you have no arms. You don't have an arm attack. So you're a barbarian. But if we put spiky boots, that's technically a weapon, so you can kick. <laughs> <laughs> 
I like remember a good, in a, that's, a, that's ridiculous a, though. It's, <laughs> yeah, I remember an old game we played at school. Yeah. Uh, one of the characters died, so one of the other characters raised him as a zombie, and we just let him play as the zombie. Oh, <laughs> that's so that, that was good. <laughs> no, no respect, uh, <laughs> but um, it's what you okay. would have wanted. Yeah, because I see like, it's kind of weird now on the, to me uh, when I see online and. Um, I have nothing against 5e at all because you know like i think it was a i think it's the right move after 4e you know it was definitely the right move in the right direction um and to me it was almost like you know i already have castles and crusades so when, when i saw 5e i was like yeah, okay it kind of looks a lot like that like now you're going to the ability scores for saves which you also did for machinations of, of, of the space princess yeah. you know, that made sense to me like that was the thing from third edition but it's kind of nice if all the ability scores have a save attached to them because then there's no um um trash stat what was it again uh, uh dump stat, it's on dump dump stat, stat yeah dump stat. yeah so stuff like that and, um but i already had castles in crusade I never felt the need to buy 5e it was never out of mm. some groinyard side of me um, but definitely, I see like the, the vibe of 5e is very much like I see people online um, asking like, has anyone had a character death in a campaign ever? I'm like, is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of you know, uh, it's different. It's a different vibe. Um, yeah, it's a bit yeah. weird because when 5e came out after fourth edition, it felt like a return to the older way of playing yes. D and D. Uh huh. Um, but the culture of the game yes. has changed so much. Yeah. I think that's or that's now to the point where the the culture has changed to the point where it's now affecting the mechanics and the interpretations and the, and the way people play. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's taken some of the some of the teeth and challenge out of it. It's definitely taken the teeth out of it. Which, you know, my take on it is, I ain't mad. Uh, I'm mad because we we've got the open gaming license from third edition. We can do whatever we want with the game. Everyone has access to the game. If that's the direction that D and D is going, like okay. The one thing that recently offended me a lot though was the, their take on canon. But uh, you know that that may be a conversation hmm. for another time. It's not Whitechester and anything. Um, I don't want to take away from the main subject matter here. Um, but okay, so <clears throat> basically you're thinking. The uh, old school gamers will know what to do with a 5e book, even if they're playing another system. You're thinking, I'll make some booklets anyway. So there you go, like uh, Morgborg, uh, OSR, like BX, D&D, or 0E yeah. through Lamentations of a Flame Princess is the one you're going for. But you know, I, that's basically any of the old ones. Um, and you're thinking, old school gamers will know what to do with it. They'll be fine. I'll, I'll give some booklets that go along with it. 5e players will have access to this and maybe see something um, a bit grittier. Yeah, uh, and I, you're talking about Grimdark, which um, up until this Indigo, I didn't even know you had your own version of 5e. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I'm barely familiar with 5e, to be honest. Like, I bought the Ravenloft book just because I, I always liked Ravenloft as a thing, but um, almost like a collector's thing, you know, but I, I don't even have the core books. I just have the Ravenloft book, for example, uh, which again, conversation for another day. But <laughs> <laughs> although, look, we're talking horror here. Uh, so, well, um, yeah. Part, part, part of the impetus to actually move this forward and start fundraising was that I was yeah. rather disappointed in, in Ravenloft. Well, so you I... killed my question now. But <laughs> <laughs> I was so, going to say, some, someone who is a 5e player. So, old school gamers, I think they already know kind of what to expect. For 5e players, and again, I'm certainly not dishing, like, I'm not like bashing anyone for having fun and, you know, like... Um, even hey, these things are more like like a dry and I from World of Warcraft now. Like it's more yeah. like this exotic race, uh, but it, it's kind of like very. Uh, it, it's not dark. We can say that. Like five E is mm. not dark. It's not what it's trying to do. It could potential rule set minor tweaks. It's not what it does as a default. So let's say that someone is a five E player. They bought Ravenloft and they had fun with horror so far. Uh, putting aside our own opinions, like, okay, is, was this a good horror supplement or not? What would you tell them going into Whitechester? Like, uh, someone goes, you know what? I, I've been playing 5e recently. I've had a lot of fun. I'm new to D&D. I got Ravenloft. It was interesting to go into different kinds of horror. 
I see James has done like uh, James Desborough has done like Whitechester and it's horror themed again. Heck, maybe they even house rule it as a domain of dread or something. I don't know. Uh, what would you tell him going in? Like, uh, what what can you expect to be the like? What can people expect to be the difference between Ravenloft and Whitechester, for example, in this approach to horror? So, I think if you look at Ravenloft, particularly the the newest version of Ravenloft, it's yes. It's more a kind of romantic horror, I suppose, mm -hmm. gothic horror, um, whereas Whitechester is much more well, yeah, the gritty, dark, close, closer yeah. to splatterpunk. There's more mm -hmm. body horror and survival horror is more where I'm aiming things, whereas something like Ravenloft, if you manage to pull it off, yeah. is much more about the sort of seductive side of, of darkness and tragedy. Um, whereas Whitechester drops you into a fairly sort of brutal fight for survival um, and forces you to make moral choices about how much you're willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. in order to survive, how far you're willing to go to survive. Okay, so in mood, would you? This is kind of a funny comparison because I guess some people go Walking Dead or stuff like that. You know the movie The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio? Have you ever seen mm -hmm. it? Yeah. So it gets stabbed by mauled by a bear, has to survive through this. Would you? S I kind of think this is a good movie to show someone who hasn't played necessarily grittier games, uh, and go like, you know what? The campaign may be a bit like this, and then you show like the Revenant, and it's definitely kind of like um, his son gets killed at the beginning, gets mauled by a bear, and almost dies. And like, the, it's not like he was up to facing that bear; that he should avoid the bear. He has to make smart decisions to stay alive. Like, go inside a horse. Like, nothing is given. You know, like every step yeah. that he has to survive. Um, I don't, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but I, I think like it's kind of like a. Funnily enough, it has nothing to do with D and D or tabletop RPGs. But I found it's a really good movie if you want to tell someone, "Hey, look, this is more like an old school vibe. Watch Revenant. This is what you can expect your character to go through. You know, like stuff like this. You know, it's not mm -hmm. you're not gonna be Zorro. You're gonna be Leonardo DiCaprio in the Revenant. You know, like it, so. <laughs> and I love the Antonio Banderas first Zorro movie. I love that movie, but it's, you know, it's, they're two different vibes. So if I, if I had to kind of go like an example of like heroic adventure and then like gritty old school, you know? Um, is that kind of what like people having to make decisions to like, like if you don't make the right decisions, you're going to lose your character. Is that kind of like the idea here? Yeah, I want to encourage people to play tactically, which I think <laughs> is something that has been lost in fifth edition um, because character mortality is so unlikely. People forget that you can retreat. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to defeat every single monster you come across. Maybe sometimes you'll find something that's bigger and nastier than you. Maybe you need to engage in some clever tactics to shift the situation in your in your favor. So that that's what I want to encourage. And I think that might be a bit of a culture shock for 5e players mm -hmm. you know, coming, coming to it. Um, but then at the same time, if we look at the sort of broader nerd culture, there is a sort of cult of difficulty, yeah. particularly in computer games. You know, the whole Dark Souls thing and Souls-like games, it's become a virtually meaningless tag now, but it basically just means fairly difficult and unforgiving. Yeah. But at the same time, you get a real sense of reward when you do manage to beat whatever it might be. So, yeah, that that's kind of where I'm angling it. Although I think that even that, I'll say it's kind of a bad comparison, I find, because Dark Souls, from what I understand, I have never played those games. But from what I understand, it's kind of like the first time around, you're not necessarily going to know what to do. And then it's kind of, oh, okay, now I know. And then you go back and you do it. But I feel like old school games, it's most like unless the GM is really out to get you, like which they shouldn't. They should just put situations and you know let let you figure it out. Um, you know when I run games, I never think of how the players are gonna get out of this. I just put a situation there. Yeah. And obviously, if it's a die for sure situation, then that's a bad one. But what I mean by that is, um, unlike Dark Souls, you know, I think some people think that old school games are some newer players 
when they hear about those cool games, they think they're going to go with their first character, the first character is going to die, and then the next one, they're going to meta game. They're <laughs> going to like know, oh, my, my character died there, therefore there's the trap. You know, they think that's old school, which it isn't. It's more applying common sense. So to give a really stupidly easy example, it's like, if you see a skeleton there and there's a hole in the like like in the middle of the skeleton um in the rib cage and there's like holes in the floor you can guess there's a spike trap you know like so that this yeah. is a very easy one but it's it's more like you know like any anything that's like a ha gotcha that that's not really what good or yeah is about, you, you know, like yeah, you want I just to wanted to mention that because people hear their souls and they think it's a, through grinding and losing lots of characters they get to. Yeah. Whereas if you use common sense, like for sure the dice can go against you, but if you use common sense normally, like you, you might go further than you think you will with the, that squishy character. You know. Yeah, it's it's yeah. about being f fair but unforgiving. <laughs> I think is exactly. so. Yeah, in in the conversation that you're having with the player, you should drop hints as to what's about to happen or, or, or what's going on um, and it's up to them to pick up on that and maybe ask the right questions um, like if you go back to really old school DD um, if you didn't have a thief in your party you could still disarm traps and and so on by describing yeah. what you were doing sort of yeah. step by step and the, and the GM would say oh, okay that, that works or that doesn't yeah. Um, it's just the thief was better at it and could do it and could do it with a roll. Yeah, go grab the like goblin corpse, throw it in there, trigger the trap, go after you know, like you don't need yeah. to do a scroll. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So yeah, it's it's all about it's all about the, the conversation, the action and reaction, mm -hmm. I think. And um a good games master isn't just arbitrarily a dick to people. No, no, <laughs> you know, no, no. Doesn't yeah, there should there should always be a clue, um, some sort of hint. Like the classic is, I don't know, uh, Temple of Elemental Evil or Tomb of Horrors, and the completely unfair, like excellent yeah. traps and things in those. That's not what most of us mean. It's more about immersion. Yeah. Um, so like if you look back at third edition, people expended a huge amount of effort in min maxing their characters and squeezing out every bonus that they possibly could. Then they don't have the energy to go at it again. That's why. Right. People... Like, so, so this is similar, but it's about the situation. It's about yes. stacking as much advantage as possible tactically in the situation. Yeah, if you if you have time. So. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, and one thing I want to mention, and we're gonna get back to specifically Whitechester, but you know, like I as a game master, my players have noticed it's kind of funny. The players in old school games, in a way, become way more overpowered than new school games because because. When they realize that, yeah, if they do everything right and they, they have good roles and everything, maybe that big bad guy they were going to face that should have normally taken the whole game session. They, they just like squish that guy because yeah. they had a good idea. And then it kind of dawns on them and like, like, oh, wait, the guy's dead. I'm like, yeah, you had a really good idea. You played it correctly and the dice were on your side and they were barely playing a role at this point. And then I kind of realize, okay, so like, if the bad guy standing there drawing his sword for a duel against me, my friend can be up on the like broken wall to just like push the big boulder on top of the bad guy, for example. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. Ten d six damage or whatever. Like, he's dead. Yeah. So it's kind of like they become way more overpowered in a, in a weird way because suddenly mm. like they they start doing stuff that in a, in a, in other games. They just react like it's a computer game in a way where it's like, okay, this is the encounter. Let's use the abilities we have on the sheet, which of course you should. Don't forget the yeah, stuff you have on yeah. your sheet, which is important um, and sometimes leads to also interacting with the world and all that. Uh, you know, like uh, if, if everything counts. If you have a bonus to interact with certain people, it's not like, oh, that sucks. What am I going to do with that? No, like interact with those people. Maybe they'll back you up in this situation or whatever. So, you know, but I think what you mean is if players come across this like huge horde of undead in Whitechester and the undead haven't seen them, they're not expected to like rush in and no. just. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we're talking about. Like they're supposed to avoid that army of undead at that moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not try and take them on. Um, yeah. yeah. And the dead are going to be a constant threat and presence pretty much everywhere 
So you've you've always got to worry about them. So in a way, they're almost more like an a, an environmental hazard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder how. What's interesting about undead is how personal people will take it. Like, if your friend just got eaten by that zombie over there, is it that important for you to get revenge, or is it like you, the same thing as if a tree had fallen on your friend? How do you see it? You know, like, yeah. Do you take it personally? Do you have to go after that undead, or it's like, ah, oh, well, it, like you know, if a tree falls on your friend. Um, or let's say a branch, the branch of a tree falls in your friend and he dies. Do you feel the need to cut down the tree? So if an undead is mindless, like and he he ate your friend, like do you feel the need to go back and kill the undead? Answers may vary. I think it's the same yeah. for wild animals, right? Like some people, like they lose a loved one to a wild animal, they go, well, that sucks, and you know that's that's uh, like, that's yeah. nature. Other people are going to be like, I'm going hunting, you know, like so. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and um, of course, not every zombie is going to be the same either. Um, I think you've seen that in The Walking Dead, where they've introduced different ones, like the uh, the dehydrated zombies that were under the salt. And um, I've been watching Walking Dead, or uh, I've barely read the comic, so the, oh, the, go ahead. They've, they've done various other other kinds. There were some that were trapped in a sewer that were all bloated and then Jeez. trying to fight them off, like the, the skin and flesh was coming away from the bone. Ah, and it's cool. got things like that. So I want that there will, there will be more than zombies and there will be a wide variety of different zombies and some of them may well surprise you. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I don't. I don't want you. I actually don't want you to elaborate too much because I want people <laughs> to read the book and be surprised. Um, but it's it's cool that you bring it up. I, you know, like it's something I was gonna broach on later. But um, I actually think it's good to not reveal too much. But it's cool to know like there's gonna be surprises there. I want to ask the Grim Dark. Okay, the, your your rule set mm. uh, for fifth edition. Um, and you say that's gonna be available starting on the thirteenth of uh, August, twenty twenty one. Um, do you know for how long? Uh, it's going to be, sorry, there's going to be a special 50% Yeah, off. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's a fe featured product. I think it's 24 hours half okay. off. Okay, yeah. very well. So I'll, I'll be sure to edit and, and post the video um, in the same day we, we do this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to ask, uh, how many pages is that book? Is it really just like, a, here's a few uh, variant rules and that's it? Or is it like, how big it's, is that? It's a pretty full full on rule set it's uh let me just find it actually i'm not sure how many pages offhand and i don't think i have my copy handy i think it's is in it the room because i was using it uh, more, more yeah way pages? way more <laughs> oh okay 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 okay, okay. um because i wasn't asking if, if they were going to be included it, it, let's say it had been like a three four page thing i was going to ask if it was going to be included in, in whitechester uh it won't be because i want okay. more money <laughs> okay <laughs> You're supposed uh, to say that uh, you wanted to focus on the product itself, and you're not supposed to mention <laughs> for money. No, just <laughs> I, I will probably include it in a bundle version of the PDF, uh, okay. and I will be giving free PDFs of Grimdark to people who back Whitechester. Okay, so there you go. That's uh, the hard so hard copy and PDF. They back it. You will send a, a PDF for Grimdark. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because that would be um, maybe the the preferred approach to the setting, perhaps. Yeah, um, I but mean, not when necessarily. I was writing, uh, or... No, not necessarily. But when I was uh, writing Grimdark, I was thinking ahead to mm -hmm. Whitechester, so um, there should be a good sort of synergy between the the two sets of. Mm -hmm. Two sets of rule, rules. Uh, let's see, page count. Uh, found it. Oh, it's currently at a full five star rating. Uh, 186 pages, A5. Oh, wow. Okay. This is, I thought it was like this, like little pamphlet thing. No. no, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's a legit source, but a source book. Um, supplement book or yeah it's um it's mostly alternates so there's some simple suggestions for quickly bringing a more grim dark flavor to your 5e games uh which i might include in the main book 
uh, just like things like restricting hit points and uh, restricting access to magic a bit. Um, but then there's the there's the full version. It's like it, the what made it such a big book is that I had to completely overhaul the magic system to make to make sense because okay. standard five E magic breaks the whole whole idea <laughs> really. Yeah, yeah. So I had I had to change that up. You can still become very powerful uh, using magic, but it's much more about preparation. Mm -hmm. um before you do something okay. or make make or making bargains with infernal powers and so on to to gain kind of like john, john constantine in a way right yeah where yeah. you normally don't seem like throwing a fireball but he'll have like this kind of ace up his sleeve magically speaking but it's very often subtle you know it's not all like normally yeah. it's not like so, but it's like like we were saying you know it's all about tactically stacking the odds in your favor and so magic will do that will do the same you're unlikely to be able to heal people during combat for example mm -hmm. but after combat maybe you can apply a poultice or say a prayer and make them feel a bit better yeah that's that's pretty cool uh it's i mean you know like it it, it kind of you can still do some fantastical stuff but it still feel like well i mean maybe game of thrones is an obvious example but why not you know like the at least in the, I haven't read the books yet. I know, I know. But at least in the show, like the, the magic users, they, they could do some really crazy stuff, but it was never like flinging a fireball in the middle of a melee, you know, like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was always like pretty cool stuff. But in a way, it made, to me, it's kind of like that sort of magic kind of becomes more impressive because it's less steps away from a reality therefore i can imagine myself more seeing that in person like i can almost imagine that if i were to see stuff like that like it you know it, it it's kind of like a magic that would make sense even though it doesn't make more sense than the flashy one really but um i'm explaining this really awfully but i mean it, you know <laughs> i think that's well, a way to for people who like to use magic without breaking that mood is you know like you said tactically and not just yeah. like what spell will I need as a wizard? Which which one do I put in the spell slot? But really, look, you're you're. This is not gonna um, be this thing where you get to ignore obstacles. Well, I mean, in some ways, but it's not gonna like make you this this superhero. But you might do something that's really really useful in that moment. You know? Yeah. So that's there's basically in Grimdark. There's three traditions of magic. There's the the cunning folk. Cunning and kenning is the same sort of root word as knowledge. Um, and that's a kind of hodgepodge of druidic traditions, herbalism, midwifery, a few charms and, and things. Um, nothing really hugely ostentatious, um, but it's kind of folkloric magic and ideas that, that we see around Britain. Like the idea of turning your clothes inside out keeps the fairies away, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it's the knowledge of that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, priests and so on, their magic is really subtle. Mm -hmm. Like they can they can say prayers and they can lay on hands and it, it, it'll have an effect, but it's all stuff that could, almost all stuff that could perhaps be explained away. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, it, it's a time when people were very faithful, so they would genuinely believe and it wouldn't shock them too much. And there's a more sort of ritual magician sort of style, which is much more about making pacts and amulets and yeah, things like that. So you sort of you invest your your power in creating these pacts and gaining these abilities. I, I did write a book for the OSR called Ars Goetia, uh, Faust Footsteps, which is very similar. So I've I've based that kind of ritual magic tradition on loosely on real world sort of ri ritual magic traditions. That's cool, and of course that's going to fit very well into Whitechester. I think like being a historical setting in real life, being set in Britain. Um, I want to ask you, what if someone says, you know what, I'm going to pick up Whitechester and I'm going to I'm going to use it for my normal D and D five E game with dwarves and elves and wizards and what does Whitechester look like for someone? And I know it's not the main goal, but let's say someone mm. 
is like, you know what? Uh, I'm interested. I just don't have the time to go into another campaign to start. Like I have this D&D 5e campaign I'm running. I will, this looks cool. I, I understand it's not going to be like the gritty mood that it's meant to portray, but it'll be enough of a departure to maybe introduce something new in the game. And uh, kind of like, in a way, kind of like Ravenloft was used back in the day where you kind of went out of the normal D&D game. You went to this like gothic horror place for a while and then came back to your normal setting. So in a way, like people might, you know, if they get into um, Whitechester, uh, you know, like the GM incorporates it into the setting, changes maybe the, the details. So it's not Britain, but something else or lowers the technology or something. What does that look like if someone wants to do that? Like uh, I'm going to grab Whitechester and like you know, like the, the square hole and the, the round <laughs> like uh, object. I'm going to like put it in the D&D 5e normal I, campaign. The <laughs> and all. Um, you'll be able to because there will okay. be 5e compatible statistics. Yeah. It will take a little bit of work because the technology level is that of black powder weapons and so on. Though that said, I think the technology level of, of D and D games has kind of moved on to the Renaissance yeah, period rather than the medieval yeah. period, so that that shouldn't be too much of a wrench. But you can always remove it. Presence, everyone there, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everyone there is a human or used to be a human, so that might be a bit odd. But then there are human kingdoms, and yeah. you don't need to change stats to say that zombies yeah, that are dwarf. Yeah. yeah, 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 <laughs> whatever. Um, and you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you can ignore the history if you want, or you can bring it into the to the kingdom that your, your game set in and say, oh, there was a revolution against the king, but he won in the end. And, you know, you can you can you can put a spin on those things. But the idea of a of a detailed walled off city that's just been kind of abandoned to the dead, I think that translates just fine. Um, but I would definitely say you should start with low level characters to get the get the most out of it. Yeah, but I, I think that still, nevertheless, um, I, I'm sure that the way it's set up, it would still give 5e players a, a feel for that because, you know, it's a 5e book. You're making a 5e book mainly with options. I think both with the knowledge that all school players can easily convert it, even on their own. And then you also mm. make those books, which even easier. Um, you know, because it's always fun when the job is done for you, but um, <laughs> it's <laughs> which is your job to do the job for other people, um, for their games. But um, I think that even then, even uh, if they go normal 5e rules and everything, just the way I'm sure you will have set up the city and the challenges, and like, for example, like I said, like there's an army there. If you're level one characters, again, not super familiar with 50, uh, fifth edition, 5e, but I'm sure there's places where if you approach it just like this is our next encounter, it's not going to go well for you. So I think even then, people will have a taste of that um, old school feel, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so the official modules and things that Wizards have put out, mm -hmm. they're very linear. Um, even the ones that allow a certain amount of free roaming or, or it's really just a choice of which encounter location you go to next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you go in a different order and not necessarily experience a very different game. So having a, a sandbox introduces that style of play to, well, hopefully will introduce that style of play to some to some 50, um, 50 players. And it feels very divided at the moment. You've got the the five E players, the the new school on one side, and the old school Renaissance on the other, and they spend a lot of time talking past each other. So I'm yeah. I'm I'm hoping that having an example, something that can appeal, hopefully to both sides, might create some understanding. That's probably too ambitious, but uh, probably, I, I would like but it. I appreciate the effort. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I kind of like sometimes I, I jokingly refer, I haven't done so online yet, but in my head, I jokingly refer to myself as a woke centrist. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, sometimes like there's there's uh, um, there's things where I kind of I kind of see it both ways or I, I see it one way, but I understand what the other side is coming from with it. 
or how can maybe the side I agree with mostly, I still find they exaggerate a bit or a lot, mm. or mm. There, there's a lot of stuff like that. You know, I, I kind of feel like I'm, I, for some reason, um, yeah, like uh, I do feel like there's some sort of like weird tabletop RPG centrist, which could have been a cool title yeah. for, for a new channel if I were to restart. But, um, you know, it, I'd, it's, I'd, it's, yeah, go ahead. I'd, I'd say that probably describes me too, really, but I have yeah. a reputation for not <laughs> being that for well, some reason. <laughs> to be honest, there's videos I watch of you where I, I, I think you make really good points, and I even agree with the video or most of it, but I can detect your lack of patience at this point with the subject. If yes. I may say so, James, like mm. I, I think you, you're very smart. You bring very good points, but I'm very objective. You know, like me, myself, like if someone goes, you're an idiot, this, 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 and that. <laughs> Most human beings out there, I'm not just saying this, if you if they start with being told they're an idiot, they're not going to hear anything else after. I really am the kind of guy, like if you go, you're an idiot, Bruno, this, 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 I might still listen to your points. I might still go like, mm. you know what, you had a point there. Also, F you for calling me an idiot, like, <laughs> you know, and probably you'd never say that to my face, it's just because we're online, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it, I can still listen to the points. So mm. what I think happens is uh, like sometimes... Uh, I can detect your impatience and you make some really smart points. And I think there's a video you made where you really came at it and you, you literally said, you're either acting in bad, if you do this, you said you're either acting in bad faith or you're an idiot. And then you, you said something like, uh, I'll give you a benefit of the doubt that you're going with the lesser of the two bad things. Or so, I don't remember how you said it. So I, I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm like, this is a really good video, but at the same time, I can acknowledge like, I cannot see anyone who disagreed with you going into this video and ending <laughs> agreeing with you at the end, except a very, well, very few people who can listen to the arguments and leave that emotional I, part aside, you know? I do try to be yeah. patient and I do strive for objectivity, but I think yeah. we do. You can't help but fail from time to time. Oh, well, yeah. Where you um, when it comes to videos, I think part of that is down to the form because you need to hook someone at the start which means sure. you either need to interest them or piss them off <laughs> or kiss their ass so they're going to pay attention to you yeah. um and i think when you're trying to persuade people you need a multitude of different approaches some people respond to rational measured explained argument some people respond to more emotive argument some people if you piss them off about something then they will try really hard to defend whatever position it is that they're holding yeah and, and fail and that can lead to a sort of revelatory experience. i don't think so Not necessarily think so, in the moment because you know no exactly that's why i'm like i remember having arguments with people and then go they go you're gaslighting but they never address my <laughs> argument they just said like i was gaslighting so it's really difficult to have conversations these days. Um, yeah, yeah. But well, I, I'm, I do, yeah. I, I'm, I'm hoping that through this I can do a show don't tell sort of thing. Yes, that's um, a good idea. It's a very good idea. Um, because I think that this is a product that right after, because you chose to make make it five E, which was a surprise to me, because you chose to make it five E. I think this is. A, even though you you don't have the best opinion of it, like the fact that Raven Love came out, it's a very good time for Whitechester. It's mm. a really good time to put this into someone's hands. I really think that. Um, and they can even I, go the missed approach where like maybe their elf ends up in actual your Whitechester setting, Britain, or yeah, why not? It's yeah. like any other setting out there, you know? Um, I, I really think there's a compatibility there. Um, it's not how I would use it because I don't play 5e at the moment, but I mean like because you chose to make it 5e, I think there's a compatibility there. And I think the people mm. can kind of see like, oh, this is what it's about, that's cool. Um, well, I, I often criticize people for using fifth edition where it's not really appropriate, and then I've used it where it's not necessarily appropriate. Uh, so maybe maybe a touch of hypocrisy there. But then the idea is to show a different way of doing horror and a different way of playing D and D, and that each side has aspects that can appeal to the other. So. Yeah. Right, so it's so one thing I'm really proud of in the book so far mm -hmm. is that it is absolutely crammed with story. So say you're out scavenging 
and you, you break into a building um, and find out that it's been boarded up on the inside. All right, and you'll move from room to room. And if you're paying attention to the descriptions and the kind of loot and stuff that you find around, you'll be able to piece together what happened in this house when the dead rose and what happened to the inhabitants. Did they get away? Were they killed? You know, wh what happened? So practically every building has a story in you know, the bloodstains and the boards and the broken windows of what happened to it and what has happened since. So it, it's, it's very nar narrative heavy if you want that. Mm -hmm. So that's something that the more old school people might come to appreciate. And then the other way, there's the you've got to consider the tactics and are we going to keep quiet so the dead don't hear us and all of these other kind of immersive qualities of old school play that hopefully the more narrative focused people will, will come to appreciate. Mm -hmm. it's from I, I fall slap bang in the middle between the old school you know, rules heavy games and, and narrative games. I like yeah. both yeah. and I prefer an, an emergent immersive narrative rather than mechanics that allow you to directly dictate story. Yeah, I think for me, it's kind of like, it kind of depends, you know, like if I'm, for example, my favorite superhero tabletop RPG is Icons, which is based on, uh, it's not like, but it's kind of based on um, Fudge and Fate, but it's not exactly the same. You, you do have hard stats, but then you have qualities, which kind of allow you to, just go with narrative stuff because you know let's say you try to do certain superheroes with gerbs which is just like not narrative at all this is simulationist um, I'm, I'm, maybe i'm sorry to use this example given the, the whole mansion <laughs> thing but uh, anyway <laughs> to to continue with what i started um look it up people if you want uh <laughs> so um it's kind of like you know when you look at i don't know oh in this issue this supernatural character that one time was weakened when he entered a church and it was never brought up again. But if I want to stat him and I have to keep that in mind, so that's a flaw I'm going to get. And it kind of becomes like you can end up like just because a character, you know, in, in comic books, when you need a character to do something, they just do it or they don't do it. Or if it's interesting for them to have a weakness in that moment, they just have it. Or if the whole Quan issue wants to slap his hand so hard that he creates a shockwave, He's basically, he basically has a range attack there. Do you, does that mean you need to now give the Hulk a range attack? You know, like, so mm. what I like is that uh, icons is kind of like a mix between like having those hard stats and then you have the qualities that are narrative. And then you can tell the, the game master, hey, um, you know what? My character is supernatural. He's of demonic origin. What if when I enter the church, it gives me trouble? And then you have like kind of that. So I think for some types of games, I never like purely narrative, to be honest. I was like at least a level simulation, but um, or how, however it's said these days. But um, I think some games can benefit from a bit of narrative aspect, you know. Mm. But then there's there's um, other games that really don't. Uh, so D and D to me does not benefit at all from narrative elements mm. beyond the very basic. I got a chance point. Can something could happen for me here? Maybe, you know, but games that apparently, and maybe I'm talking out of my, uh, you know, out of my hole here, but, uh, you know, games where like the player just goes, you know what, actually, this is uh, what's going on in the world, and therefore I get to do this. Yeah. And maybe it doesn't fit with whatever the GM set up, and now they have to like do mental gymnastics, and, you know, like, I don't yeah. Know. That that's less of a pain in the ass with the more narrative games because they are much less prep heavy. Okay. You know, if if a player has the ability to spend a point and have something happen in the middle of a D&D game, which is quite stat heavy and you've got to plan your encounters and, yeah, and balance, and balance yeah. then it's a huge pain in the ass. With a more narrative game, less so. But then that's the risk when you bring narrative elements into more complex games. Mm -hmm. it, it can start causing those sorts of problems and, and headaches for the games master because D&D &D just doesn't really suit an improvisational style of play. No. I'm not doesn't. that down on on 5th edition. I mean, I play it every week with the with the tabletopless crew. 
So yeah, I've been playing it a lot, and that that influenced my decision to include to include five E because, like a lot of people, they call any kind of role playing D and D. It's yeah. like a brand name like Kleenex or Hoover or or, or whatever to to a lot of people. People so watch that... MMA, watch UFC, just to plug my other hobby. Yeah. They... <laughs> <laughs> so even if they're watching another like promotion, they say, oh, I'm watching UFC. Like, <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I have problems with a game like uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, or Apocalypse World, particularly. Uh, other versions of it are a bit more, a bit more conventional, and they work better for me. But it's this weird combination where you've got these moves which are really tightly defined. Yeah. Yeah, and if you do something that fits a move, it's a move. And if you do something that doesn't fit a move, it's down to the games master to just arbitrarily decide. Right? Yeah, I, I bought Monster of the Week. I bought that book, uh, and uh, I was kind of like excited about it at first, and then I kind of read through it, and I did have trouble. Like I, I have trouble with games where like, I have a mental block with games that someone makes this generic defense and then they explain away what it looks like so oh i grabbed the table and put it in front of me and that's my defense if you will but then i'm like what do we do with someone who just comes up with a common sense idea what if the table is there doesn't that step on the ability of the other person to justify this narrative thing you know what i mean so i'd rather mm. have a game where there's the uh, physical ability of a person to grab the table in time to put in front of them, and this is the harness of the table, and that's it. You know, like as an example. Yeah. Well, and, and now, it, so, so it's kind of like where where things get a bit uh, muddled. Uh, but but I think some people have trouble. Like, I think some people like to approach their tabletop RPGs like a uh, choose your own adventure book, where it's, mm. it's like they're still role playing, they're still going through emotions, but they just want a few sets of choices, and that's good for them. Uh, and because you know the immersion only goes so far, I, I, yeah. they can still experience. They 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 can get really involved and experience it a lot, like they're watching a really good movie. Whether at this point, like there's a lot of immer I shouldn't say immersion. You can watch a movie and be really immersed, but the amount to which they can really feel out the I'm living in this world is more limited. And mm. I know this sounds condescending, but I'm just gonna say what I'm thinking. <laughs> so I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> and uh, other people are like, well, you know, I just want to do whatever I think of. I don't need a set of moves, you know, like to. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's the way I prefer. Yeah. And I like it when I like it when story and and moments emerge out of play from the interface between the the rules and the and the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, through I tried running an apocalypse world game, and like it doesn't handle. A lot of things that are standard in most role-playing games like stealth or climbing <laughs> things like that you're just supposed to arbitrarily decide but to me that takes away from the character because if yeah. you've if you've described a character who lived in a bunker in the mountains half his life then that should be reflected in his ability to climb and so on it shouldn't just be down to me deciding that I want to do something dickish to your character and have you fall. You know, it should come down to a role. And if you do fail, it's going to be a rare event because your character is skillful. And then story starts to starts to emerge from that. Mm -hmm. So to, to put it in a Whitechester example, so say again, you break into a house, you're going to have to yeah. do it quietly. So yeah. there might be a role there that's more difficult because you're trying to break down the door quietly so the dead don't hear you. Then maybe you're crawling around the house you know, looking for things to, to find and it's it's wet because there's a hole in the roof. So you find a jar of pickled onions or something. Like, oh, great, some food. And there's a chance it's going to slip from your hands. And then we roll. And if it does, you know, there's a smash. There's onions all over the place and the dead hear you and they start to come. And there's only one door in or out. So how do we deal with this? Do we stand and fight? Well, more dead are going to come, and more dead are going to come. Yeah. The more noise we make, so so what do we do? Okay, we rush up to the roof because you said there's a hole because the the water came in, right? Okay, yeah. so yeah, maybe the stairs collapse on your way up. Let's do a roll for that. You get up there, you're going to have to climb out onto the roof. Maybe you can jump onto the next building, but if you fail, you're going to plummet and land in the mob of dead that's crowding around yeah. the house. 
So yeah, the story comes from the roles and and the interaction yes, and, and what yes. happens, and it could go either way. And because I don't know, as the games master, I'm more engaged and I'm having more fun because I don't know what's going to happen. Exactly, I 100% agree with you. I, only one time did I have a player who did not fit my style of game mastering at all because that happened, like what you just said, like they had to climb on top of a roof. Well, oh, a place I already established was super run down. And, uh, you know, through some die rolls, the guy fell through the roof and he didn't die from it. He barely got any damage, if at all, but he was really offended that that had happened to him. Because they can, kind of like they can't imagine Aragorn going through that, right? Although I really like yeah. to point to the Indiana Jones movies. In Indiana Jones, he's always failing his role. Yeah, he's you always seem like he gets dealing hurt. with. Yeah. yeah, you always seem like everyone thinks of Indiana Jones as this cool guy, but he's always struggling. Like you know, in the Last Crusade, he's hanging from the tank, and like that one wasn't a good role. Like he, I mean, maybe he <laughs> did a reflex save to hang on at the last minute, and and um, it's not out yet on YouTube, but. Uh, you, You've been a player in a game around, and you know I love to put my players in trouble through die yeah. rolls, and then whatever happens there. And so this is something that you experience firsthand. Uh, like I just think it makes for, and then the combat is not boring at all when you think that way. Like things yeah. happen in combat, you know, or things happen in the adventure. So I find that very often um, in in more modern mindsets, when people try to recreate this cinematic feel, it's kind of ironic. Because to me, mm. I've often had the cinematic feel a lot more in old school games. Because when you watch a Jackie Chan movie, for example, Jackie Chan is doing plenty of things. He's uh, and then the bad guys will do something, doesn't go his way, and like he has to, he does something else, and sometimes he fails, and and it makes for an interesting thing that's happening, and it makes for something cinematic, and then he uses the environment. Whereas uh, in in um, in more modern games, like people think it's cinematic because they have this special attack, they have this, this, this but then it's just like kind of two people standing there. And doing yeah. their th their special stuff, right? But in a more old school game, it's kind of like um, because the die rolls are not just your special attack; they're they're really more. You know, when you don't have that super mega blast, at least you can't spam it all day. Even a high level wizard won't be able to spam it all day. Like maybe you are grabbing that ladder and throwing it on top of the soldiers or something, or the zombies that are approaching. In case of Whitechester, you know, like yeah. so. It becomes a lot more creative. It becomes like this. It's a story to be told. Then, then uh, once it's all said and done, all those die rolls that a lot of people are like, uh, "Oh, why do die rolls for this? Just let them do it." Uh, well, yeah, then they just do it. Like it's I have. Less, like, it's it's less memorable when yeah. I just arbitrarily decide what happens, whereas all the all the yes. really funny and memorable moments in gaming. Have come about through dice dice rolls, like like the Hobbit that one shotted a Balrog with a short bow because he got this enormous critical in in Merp, or um, the grizzled veteran guardsman who in the game's first goblin we came up against got a crit, stabbed him in one eye. Next turn, got another crit, stabbed him in the other eye, blinding him completely. You know, it, it was it was a shit thing to happen to the character, but it was it was funny. <laughs> Yeah. Or the cyberpunk character who was in the cab of a of a fuel tanker truck when it got blown up, oh. right? So he goes rocketing out of out of this cab with all four limbs blown off, bleeding. Keeps saving on all his mortality rolls, but he landed. We, we, we had the had the town laid out this desert town laid out in a yeah. grid, and we randomly determined where he landed, and he fell down the well. Of course, he didn't have any arms or legs, so he couldn't climb out. He was still bleeding. He made all the mortality <laughs> saves for the blood loss and drowned. Right? Now, that's a really memorable moment. Okay, you know what happened to, to in a game I played? Run, by the way, by, by the, that girl who uh, was offended by your book back in the day. And like now she, she has a lighter <laughs> attitude, the, the uh, uh, Slayer's Guide to Female Players. Um, and she she put us in me and, and her boyfriend were like the two players and we were in this situation where like this underground temple of cultists and there's there's near the the sea and like there's a trap where it opens a, a hole in the wall and the water starts rushing in and there's of course like civilians trapped there right and uh, the other character doesn't care my character has a good alignment and the other character just because he knows that my character will try to save him starts helping so what happens we start doing swim checks very quickly 
and there's debris. So what happens? Every round, we're getting hit. We don't even know how long, like, first of all, we don't know if we're going to make the swim checks every round. And second, like, every round is kind of like we're getting hit by debris. There's nothing we can do. Like, we can dodge it. And so we're, like, saving people, taking them to a ladder, but, go, like, staying in the water to save other people. And then at the end, what happens is his character gets hit by debris, and he's unconscious in the water. So he's going to drown. My character has, like, one hit point left, literally. And I'm next to the ladder. And I'm like, how, I'm like, like, okay, I can't stay there. I'm going to die too. And it's a really messed up thing. But then what happened is uh, my character had a cape. And so he just grabbed it, told someone like, hold on to my cloak. As soon as I grab him, pull me out. Like one of the people he saved. And so he grabs the guy and the other one pulls him out. So he doesn't spend a single round in there to be hit by the re at the end of the round. <laughs> And that's the whole thing. That's that's amazing. And, and the, there was also in that game like one time where uh, my character was wounded and he had to, the other character had to carry me back to the city. So we took turns saving each other. And legit by the dice, like it was a 3.5 game, following the rules for uh, Force March and all of that, carrying me with that, he literally fell unconscious at the gates of the city. It wasn't like the the she didn't the, the GM she didn't like set it up to be narratively cool or whatever. It really happened like that, and it was so cool because it actually happened. Like, when these things happen by the dice, it's kind of like it feels so legit and so cool. Because you can tell at any moment, oh, yeah, he, he falls in consciousness at the gates of the city. And, you know, if it's something the GM just decided, it's kind of like, okay, cool. But if it really happened, it, it, it really happened yeah. because the dice said that, you know, or, or like... All those things, or if we're just swimming and that's fine, you know, like we don't have to do swim checks. Yeah, we just get everyone out, like, and then we can kind of like calculate how many rounds we have before we hit by the mm. debris. It's, it's just not the same. And and, and so, yeah. I think when you got into Whitechester, like, and you said like the, the jar that's it's greasy or something, and people can yeah. can drop it if they're not careful. <laughs> That is so undignified, but it's so cool <laughs> because in mm. movies you have it all the time. Like you have that, like uh, in uh, Lord of the Rings and Fellowship of the Ring, when one of the hobbits, Merry or Pippin, I don't remember, like just goes to touch that arrow and the corpse just falls in the well and then everyone knows they're there, right? Yeah. And well, that's not necessarily a die roll, I guess, but it's just like it's an event that it's kind of like so banal, but it leads to something really freaking cool and epic, right? Yeah. And people kind of resist that. They resist the idea that, oh, come on, are you telling me my character dropped the jar of pickles or onions or whatever? And they're like kind of offended sometimes. It's, yeah, but look at what it leads to, you know? And Indiana Jones was messing up all the time. He was messing up all the time and it always led to cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's it snowballs. Yeah. yeah, and if your character is eaten by zombies, that's the genre. It's horror, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you'll still be out there somewhere. Maybe you'll get to eat one of the other players. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I think someone could start a thread online. And like, if your character dies in Whitechester, just put up a description online so someone can grab you as a zombie. Yeah. And you know, like, okay, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use your character. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is meant to, uh, there's fifth, uh, at the moment we're talking, there's, um, just to kind of like uh, come to a wrap, there's 50 days left for uh, for the Indigo campaign. At the moment, uh, you've unlocked compatible with Morgborg. Yep. And uh, Lamentations, it's uh, not reached yet, I think, right? Is it? There? Uh, not yet, but not not far off. Unless I've had a few donations while we've been talking. I mean, Let me refresh the page. Uh, let's see. So Lamentations is at, uh, oh, you put in pounds, you monster. <laughs> uh, so we're at 1,348 pounds. We need 1,500 to unlock um, Lamentations, Lamentations early. So 6%. So we, yeah, yeah. We've, had a, we've had a few more. I think we've got um, a reasonable chance of re reaching that goal. Oh, I think so, yeah. And the um, oh yeah, because you you uh, you say early because you you'll eventually get to it. I think is what you said, or correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to try and encourage some early sort of um, people people to get in early because you make on all these campaigns you make 
most of your money in like the first and last week always mm. Yeah. So I'm trying to encourage people to get involved early more yeah. and, to, and to keep paying attention to it because the, the best ambassadors for a, a crowdfunder are the people who've backed it because you know, yeah. they're, they've got a vested interest in, in seeing it succeed. Mm -hmm. So originally, Morkborg was a stretch goal and Lamentations was a stretch goal, but I decided, well, yeah, let's do a couple of funding sprints. So mm -hmm. if you can get to this point, early then i'll unlock that ahead of time yeah so. and um and what i like about your campaign is that it's it's um to the point in what it offers like it, it doesn't go like overboard like I, I think that's a good sign when when you know like when a campaign is like this is a product you know a few things here and there but they don't you don't go crazy with the other stuff you know and then i guess yeah it's kind of like people can get really excited when they see a lot of bonus stuff, but you know what? Realistically, it's much better when you see like someone who's focused on the product. Let me tell that to everyone. If you see a good focus, this is a product. Maybe a few things here and there are logical extensions. It's not like, uh, oh, and here's the real life 3D model of the NPC <laughs> that we're all, if you reach a stretch goal, you know what? It starts to get fucky. You know, like, uh, like completely off track. And so this is good. This For people who don't know, if you want to look back at an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter, look for someone who has a, like, a good focus on what the material they're presenting is and wants to offer and understands that maybe there's something that might be a later campaign, you know, like, or so it, this is a really good sign. Also, I want to say if, you know, I was kind of making a joke, people whose characters die and are zombies in the game. If you actually want to be a zombie in Whitechester, that's uh, something you can unlock. Yes, right? that's, a, that's the... a perk called uh, called iZombie. Um, and it doesn't have to be you. You can put other people you know or politicians, <laughs> someone you don't like, can be added as a character zombie. Some, someone paid me to put his ex-wife in, so. <laughs> oh... <laughs> Are you gonna go through with that, or I will disguise it to an extent to uh, for plausible deniability, but uh, but now you said I... it. <laughs> well, I could be lying. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait. Why would they? Someone hurts you. You know, you want to you want to do something back at them, and as as things go, it's pretty <sighs> harmless. I would say. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's just, come on. You are beating a dead horse. I just hope I don't get. I <laughs> <Just that, laughs> hope I don't get dozens of people asking me to put zombie Trump in it now. <laughs> Isn't that already the case? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of politics, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna. St if you can, uh, are you okay with a few more minutes? Uh, yeah, ten okay. more minutes. Okay, cool. I wanted to ask you, and I forgot to ask you early on because we've got sidetracked talking about our old characters and events and campaigns, which is the trap every time you start talking about tabletop RPGs. Um, I don't know if you've heard there's currently a pandemic going on. Do you hear about it? I, I know not everyone knows. Is, I know. Is there really? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah man. It's uh, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, which leads to hilarious sentences like "I'm not anti-vaxxer, but you know," which, <laughs> <laughs> which I make a link to other "I am not this, but you know," and so like, "I'm not anti-vaxxer, but yeah, well, maybe you are." Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, all that said, um, jokes aside, uh, I I'm very frustrated with people who are taking the pandemic lightly. Um, mm. So are you? You know, we're publicly open about it. Um, have you, and I, I know maybe this is a touchy question in a way, but have you vented some of those frustrations in, the, you know, because the zombie plague, there's a pandemic going on. Have you steered away from that or have you maybe like as an artist gone like, you know what, I'm going to vent some frustrations here? Well, I, I'm trying to remember when I originally came up with the idea for this because it's some years ago now. Um, I can figure it out, actually. Um, but through the writing, let's say, or... I mean, obviously, the pandemic has put it into a new. It, it's it's reframed what I was doing. Okay. Um, so actually, I originally came up with the idea for this book. In probably 2005 or 2006. And wow. then in June 2007, 
a new comic strip came out in 2000 AD called Defoe 1666, which was basically my idea. <laughs> so um, I, I put it towards the back of the list um, yeah. because I you didn't want to be. Space. Yeah. I didn't want to be accused of doing a rip off. So I thought I'd, uh, it's a good idea. I'll, I'll leave it for a, as it turned out many years <laughs> but, um but it's such a strong idea i think that i just i just kept coming back to it and sort of tinkering with it um but yeah the i always thought being a, a naive crumbly old socialist that i am that a big crisis would bring people together and would heal some of the rifts in the same way that you know big wars have in the past yeah let's all pull together and and um and survive this and that hasn't happened <laughs> and no, it's been and, uh, very very disappointing yeah it, it has and uh, you know also like as you know because i always bring it up i also like mma and all that on the, on the twitter side of the mma things like there's so many people that kind of have this very I get their fighters, but it's like they think they have to fight a virus or something. They think like it's it's kind of like um, if they show fear to a virus, it's like they showed fear to a man or an opponent or something. I don't know what the mentality is. It's really frustrating. So I'm kind of exposed to it very often. Like I think at least on the tabletop RPG side where people are more like left leaning, at least when I go to that, like it's like each Twitter gives me a different kind of stress when I see how mm. people react to things. Uh, but I'm very much exposed to that, and you follow a lot of politics, so I can't even ima- I can't even imagine what well, you see. On yeah, your side. but I mean, <laughs> it's worse in the in the in the states, I think. Oh than, yeah, any, than anywhere else. Yeah. But British society is very divided at the moment as well, um, on similar but but different lines. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me not to take the the pandemic and the response to it it's hard for me not to take it personally because mm-hmm. i'm high risk i've got reduced lung capacity i've got friends who are immunocompromised because they've had cancer and so on and all these people cavalierly going about without masks and refusing to take the vaccine and whittering on about vitamins and and whatever you know it's it's like you're not just taking a risk with your own life and your own health you're taking a risk with mine and some of my dearest and dearest people. Now, usually yeah. I like to intellectualize and, and move back from things and try and be objective. But it is. It is deeply personal and it is deeply distressing. Um, but then in some of the background reading I was doing for the for the book, I did start to see parallels with the way a lot of people are acting. So during the plague um, at at various times, you know, there were people who did the right thing and isolated, um, took care of each other. Other people succumbed to to fear and allowed horrible things to happen to people. Um, Others just went from town to town, village to village, where the population had been virtually wiped out. I just sort of broke into buildings, drank all their booze, fucked in the street, you know. Other other people went sort of religious fanatic, which I think is equivalent to the conspiracy theorists that we see. You know, they were self-flagellating. And they spread more of the plague, ironically. They're just parallel because the, the flagellating themselves, they were spreading the plague over many places. And it's kind of like the same way someone who has conspiracy theories and they're shared on Twitter and Facebook and like, oh, you know, actually yeah. the vaccine is going to make you uh, like mind controlled by the government or whatever. They, this is a, like an exaggeration, but let's say yeah. people going like, oh, the vaccine is actually going to harm you. Like they, they, they're going with that narrative and they spread it. So in a non-physical way because of current technology, but it's kind of similar. Like you have people spreading it even more through this information in this case. Uh, but yeah, it's it's. Um, and you know, I was yeah, just yeah. curious, you know, like as you no, can't really compare the zombie a zombie plague with. Well, but at the same yep. time, you can draw parallels, I guess. So, like, so the zombies have come directly after the Black Death came back. So you know, yeah. there's plenty of bodies to rise up. Yeah. But yeah, if I was going to model it on what is happening, you'd have people wandering into the zombies, demanding to be bitten, <laughs> basically. <So> I, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I've it's tried. not a perfect comparison. I yeah, know. I, I was I've just tried. curious. And, yeah. <laughs> no, I've, I've tried. I've tried to avoid it because yeah. um, it it is personal. But eh, maybe there's a couple of touches here and there, yeah. or I've made some sort of sort of comment. Yeah, and again, another another direct comparison you can make between those two cases. You know, like but yeah, yeah. Uh, I I always thought that. <laughs> If COVID made people who had it like they ma made men like <laughs> impotent, <laughs> that, like there's a one percent chance you'll never be able to lift it up again, <laughs> they would all take it seriously. <laughs> well, the, there's a one percent chance it's gonna fall off. <laughs> well, the Black Death killed a yeah. third of Europe, right? Yeah. And people weren't taking that seriously. So nah. basically yeah. it would be. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it, uh, yeah, I think there's, a, I, I think we'll get rid of it, but it's a, just like, it could have been so much quicker. You know, like it, it's kind of like yeah. the same people ranting about how like masks and social distancing don't work are the ones who are not doing it in the first place. So it's kind of like, not, it's not like everyone jumped on board, did it, and then we go like, oh, well, maybe it didn't work. There was always a good chunk of people that are doing it. Therefore, it, it's not you know, it's this repeating mm. cycle. And and anyway, yeah. So there is there is one thing I would say that is very definitely commentary that's in it. So like this this is like I said, this is the year after Newton came out with all his massive, you know, world changing theories and and publications. So it's really also the, the dawn of the age of science, with the the foundation of the Royal Society and, uh, and all of that kind of thing. So there's a definite tension between science and, and magic that runs through the that runs through the game. In the same way that we're seeing a lot of the resistance to health measures in the real world, a lot of the resistance that is being led by churches and you know ev evangelical groups. So gotta love yeah, them. That, gotta love them. <laughs> that's that's probably the the. Did I mention the I most... live in Canada? It's really interesting what they're discovering behind schools now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, religions. I, I yeah, I miss George Carlin. Yeah, mm. <laughs> it could be interesting. And Hitchens. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, it. But okay, yeah, it, I didn't want to go too much into like ah, us yes. like ranting about something that is kind of at this point like you know what it is. Uh, but um, okay, uh, James, this this is ha this has gone way longer than than uh, I thought we expected it to go. That's cool. I had fun. <laughs> well, that's good to know that you had fun. If you had told me that was a miserable experience, I would have told you wait until I run the next actual player you're supposed to play and then you'll know what misery is. <laughs> but since you say you had fun, I'll be gentle um, as a game master. Now, okay, uh, any last parting things that you want to mention about the project that we didn't bring up in this uh, very long conversation and anything that uh, was left out or that you want to add before we go? Um, so you're saying that, you know, that it's focused and I haven't really talked to a huge amount about stretch goals and, and so on. Uh, that's because I've run crowdfunders before and I know the I know the pitfalls yeah um but basically unless I think of anything amazing and I'm absolutely sure I can deliver it any additional money over the amount that I need to raise will go into more art so there's a couple of um guys who do really detailed macabre illustrations for like black metal albums and things so I want to try and get one of them on board if I raise enough money I might bring Michael Manning back to do a, to do a piece or two for me so yeah that that's the stretch goal the more money that's put into Dude, it the I, more artistic it will be <laughs> let me tell you just said that and the, the person who did the art for very quickly the per, i'm working on a book uh, and that's going to be based on the system from machinations of the space princess which you made and the cool. person who did the art for it is someone who does covers for uh, metal i don't know which metal bands which <laughs> death Pink, something metal metal or whatever or gastral metal i don't know which metals but he does covers for the metals out there so you just said i'm like yeah okay I, I like i like that vibe for art i don't even listen to the thing i just like the the art of it um but um like yeah it's because it, i'm looking at the indiegogo and i want to say this this like black and white art is really really cool uh, i like how it looks it yeah, i think 
let's face it at this point um there's there's tabletop role-playing games for everything and what you can expect out of the book is to immerse you into that vibe and when you run it that object like for example generic systems are always useful but when you're flipping through a generic system you're often gonna if you go from like the cowboy to the superhero a few pages later like because technically you have a system for everything now every idea you have you can but at the same time like you're not necessarily into that vibe you know it's easy to get yeah. out so when you see art in a book that is like kind of like this object that really immerses you um so i think it's really cool what you you just said it's i think it's uh, is it mentioned in the indiegogo that like any any um yeah it's, it's money? in the it's in the longer description which most people don't read but, <laughs> but it's in, i did and, not yeah. and i'm doing the interview was, with you so there you go. <laughs> and, and and it was a definite choice to go black and white because i want to have that kind of um woodcut sort of sort of look to it in a lot yeah, of ways I, I cannot forgive imperial masquerade for going like photoshop larp photos of people in parties and people sweating through their shirts oh yeah this is totally a vampire <laughs> gathering oh yeah sure and the guy the venture venture with the unzipped pants and <laughs> like I miss that old black and white art. I'm not, no bones about it. Like the the V5 was made for LARPers. That wasn't made for me. It's, Surely it would be a Toreador with his trousers unzipped. You'd think, right? You'd think. You'd think. <laughs> We're gonna keep talking if you don't end the show. Okay, James. Yes. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. James, thank you for coming, and uh, right. it was a lot of fun. And I'll, I'll upload this as quickly as possible so uh, whoever watches this can can uh, know about the 50 percent which they will already know if they follow you on twitter of course so by the time you watch the video they're like I already saw james post about it okay <laughs> <All right. laughs> everyone get whitechester it's gonna it looks really really cool that's all i gotta say